Um, welcome everyone to, to this timely event entitled The State of Play in Ecuador, Understanding Muerte Cruzada and President Lasso's Dissolution of the National Assembly. Um, I'm Guy Mintel, I'm president of Global Americans. And for those who don't know, uh, Global Americans is a think tank here in Washington that focuses on Western Hemisphere foreign policy with a particular focus on democracy, development, and human rights. We have programs all throughout the hemisphere, including an extremely comprehensive program on US-Ecuador relations. Uh, and we're publishing daily on those themes at theglobalamericans.org. So if you find this or other conversations that we put on regularly interesting, uh, I would encourage you to find us there or across social media at username Global Americans. Um, so I wanna start by thanking our wonderful panel for being with us today uh, to spend the next hour or so unpacking recent developments in Ecuador, including what Muerte Cruzada means, its legal basis, um, the context for its invocation, and what the road ahead looks like for Ecuador. Um, we'll get to all of that in just a second, but before we do, I want to start by briefly doing some introductions, and, and then we'll dive into it. Um, I do want to note for, for our guests here with us um, that, that we'll be closely monitoring the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen for questions. Um, so we do invite our audience to contact us in that way if they have any questions as the event progresses. Um, so with us, we have Sebastián Hurtado and Natalie Sari Suárez. Uh, Sebastián is an Ecuadorian political analyst and economist. He is the president and founder of Profitas, Ecuador's leading political risk consultancy firm. In addition to Sebastián's work at Profitas, he regularly comments on fast-moving developments in Ecuador for international outlets, such as the Financial Times and The Economist. And I should note that as part of our larger program exploring the future of US-Ecuador relations, in November of 2022, Profitas and Global Americans jointly published a special report entitled Ecuador and the US-China Rivalry, which assess pragmatic approaches to limit risks amid US-China competition. Um, Natalie Sari Suarez is the president of Centro Competitividad in Invasión, a nonprofit organization working to improve Ecuador's competitiveness based on a dialogue between academia, uh, the state, the private sector, and civil society. Um, Natalie served as the ambassador of Ecuador to the United States from 2012 to 2015 and was formerly president of an education nonprofit foundation. Natalie is also, and we're very proud to say this, one of the co chairs of Global Americans' high level working group on US Ecuador relations. Um, I could not think of two better voices and analysts to unpack this very complicated situation in Ecuador today um, and, and allow us to kind of make sense of what Muerte Cruzada means and what we might expect going forward. Um, so I think with that, uh, we'll, we'll dive right into it. And I want to start maybe, if I can, with some scene setting here. And, and, and Natalie and, and Sebastian, uh, feel free to correct me if any of my facts are, are a little bit off. Um, but I do want to set the scene as, as far as I see it and, and see what you think of the way forward. Um, so we saw last week President Lasso appeared before the National Assembly at the beginning of his impeachment trial, and he said, my accusers have displayed unparalleled inventiveness. They have created a fictitious situation that does not solve the problems of the people or anyone else. One day later, he made good on a threat to invoke Muerte Cruzada, which is a, a constitutional mechanism translating in English as roughly uh, crossed or mutual death, which allows him to dissolve the legislature by presidential order, effective immediately on the basis of serious political crises and domestic unrest and triggering forthcoming presidential and legislative elections in Ecuador. Muerte Cruzada, to be clear, as, as far as I understand, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, allows either the National Assembly or the president to interrupt the terms of both of those institutions to call for general elections to replace those positions. And the National Assembly actually attempted to trigger Muerte Cruzada in 2022 due to the intensifying protests across the country, though that motion failed to garner the requisite votes. Uh, president Lasso's usage of Muerte Cruzada marks its first effective use since its inclusion in the 2008 Constitution. So with that lengthy primer on, on Ecuadorian constitutional law, my, my first question to both of you, and maybe we'll start with Natalie and then we'll go to Sebastian. My first question to both of you is, can you paint us a little bit of a picture um, of what things look like politically, socially, economically 
and from a security standpoint in Ecuador today? What are the political crises that President Lasso is referring to when he invokes the Muerte Cruzada provision of the Ecuadorian constitution? Natalia, good morning. Good morning. Hi, um, Guy, thanks for the invitation. It's, it, it's kind of uh, very interesting to analyze Ecuador among all the uncertainties that are surround us. But I also would like to say hello to some friends that I see among the attendees. And, and it's always to have you. I hope uh, you have a very interesting questions for, for us. So saying that, um, you need to understand that Ecuador has been uh, going through a very difficult economic situation, not only um, among the two years of President Lasso, but it, it's it's coming, you know, uh, um, I will say the last six years have been years of very low uh, uh, economic growth. And also, I feel like in the last uh, two years, I mean, uh, President Lasso won with a lot of uh, expectation about uh, being a pro uh, a pro business government that will bring a lot of prosperity in the country that will take care of uh, corruption, which was one um, a very very um, key topic in his campaign. But sadly, you know, in the last two years, Ecuadorians have experienced a lack of access to you know um, crucial. Uh, public services. I mean, it's been a torture to get a passport or, you know, to get your license or or many other very day-to-day um, -day, um, services. And, you know, education, it's uh, it's in a, in a very silent, giant crisis, like uh, most Latin American countries after the pandemic. And Ecuador is, was one of the countries that had the uh, schools closed for the longest period. So, the loss on learnings are, you know, as big as that too. And health, you know, health is being crucial for Ecuadorians. I have to say that the the, the Lasso administration was very keen and, and efficient, you know, in, in tackling what the President Moreno have been um, accomplished, you know, according, you know, regarding the uh, getting the vaccines and everything. So that was successful. And, and that was something that, I think people appreciate the most from this administration. But just to put it you know, in a sentence, I mean, this is a government that have been not able to execute uh, the, their own budget and uh, particularly the investment budget, which is key for the provision of those services that I already have talked about you. So um, the execution is under 60% of the, the, of the, of the investment and, and in the security uh, portion of that investment pie is below 40%. So the people are really, really tired. I mean, the, the capital, the political capital, the president has been low because of that, because just just their own uh, government mistakes. And when you have a president has been preparing for 10 years and have a foundation, you know, you imagine that he will gather the best people in the country that, would, they will, that he will gather, you know, the people with most experience in public and uh, procurement with public management, but that wasn't the case. So just to set the scene, I mean, you have citizens that were very, very tired. And then you have to add the security question. And the security question is a very, very um, um, complex one because you have to understand that Ecuador is among the two largest producers of cocaine in the world, which are Peru and, and, and Colombia, Colombia and Peru. And we used to be in the past a, a transit country. But you know what happened with the Colombian uh, war program? It does, they, they have a decentralized, you know, the most violent parts of the of that change of that uh, you know that, of that global change, and 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 of course that that that, that percolated in the in the in the Ecuadorian uh, economy. We are dollarized economy, so that makes the transit and the and the. Um, you know, and the and the and the and the trying to get those 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 dirty resources and economy a little more easy, and and also um, you know you have in the in the Korea presidency in the beginning of that there was a this kind of um, I would say you know naive uh, thinking that you know we should open you know that globalization should include the movement of people and and we opened the country. Uh, and that create um, a way, you know, for many, many people involved in this business, in this dirty business to come to Ecuador. So security is a very complex thing. And we are, you know, now in the spotlight because we, we have become, you know, a violent country. You know, think that we were not uh, 
accustomed, you know, citizens are really afraid. You know, if you if you talk with citizens in Ecuador, they are afraid, afraid to go to the streets, afraid, and that is being affecting to the economy too, because if you stay at home, you know, you stay away from restaurants, you stay away from, you know, from, from consumption. So that's also affecting the economy light. So politically speaking, Lasso was a very, very low political capital. And the assembly, you know, even worse because you know every year we every election we are saying you know we are we're we're uh, reaching the bottom, but we don't, and we have this national assembly that's you know it's been it's been really a nightmare, and I would say that you know the the impeachment um, case, it, you know it has a a bias a lot of bias, but what it's important for the public to know is that. Uh, the president last run in this anti-corruption campaign, and he failed. He failed at it. I mean, you you have this uh, particular case that is related to Flopec. When you know you have audios about the, the this in Ecuador, you have this very very pof, powerful position that controls all the public companies, which are the you know the the most the the, the ones that are expend the most. You know, like uh, the, the oil company or the telephone company. Um, so there is a very powerful position. And in, in that position, that man was found in, in tapes with the president's, um, the president's uh, brother-in-law, uh, you know, talking about bribery. So, I mean, this was an explosion. You know, you have this, this low sentiment about access to public services, access to health, access to education, and then you have this corruption case. And the president wasn't, you know, um, clear from the beginning, wasn't really um, uh, clear about how he was going to handle this corruption case, how he was going to end corruption in the public statement. So the citizens were also disappointed about how he handled the case. So, see, you know, situation is it's complex, very complex, but now at least there's one certainty. We have elections, we're going to elections, and I mean, in in a in a mist, um, I, as I say, low um, a low sentiments uh, for for Ecuadorians about uh, politicians, um, and of course we can discuss more later about particularly scenarios, uh, you know, regarding the the national election that is now in place. Thank you so much, Nathalie. Um, Sebastian, same question to you. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you see the political, social? economic and security situation in Ecuador today, and a little bit more about how you see the political crises um, that President Lasso was referring to when he invoked Muerte Cruzada. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the fact is that we've been warning about uh, political destabilization in Ecuador for quite some time now, and, uh, and here we are. Uh, why we were expecting political destabilization, there are several reasons, and I would like provide some background on that, uh, because that will give you an idea on what the political situation has been or is it right now. Well, it starts with the fact that I think President Lasso got a very weak mandate when he was elected. Uh, it is important to understand that President Lasso was elected in 2021 with fewer votes than what he received four years earlier when he lost the election. So it was a weak mandate that he received. And basically, he ended up winning the election because we have an unprecedented number of invalid voting in that election. Um, and if President Lasso got a weak mandate, you know, I think his economic liberalization agenda got a, an even weaker one. So I don't think most of the people that voted for President Lasso necessarily voted for his reform agenda. And at the same time, we elected, uh, I would say center-right president with a economic liberalization agenda. And at the same time, we elected a center to left wing Congress where, you know, the largest uh, political bloc in Congress belong to the radical opposition to President Lasso, namely Correismo. And at the same time, it was a Congress, it was a Congress, it is a, it was a Congress that had an unprecedented representation of indigenous groups. 
Uh, and I think, you know, it was really hard for President Lasso to move forward with, uh, with his economic and political agenda in those circumstances. And throughout the past, so that's what he started with. And he tried to make some initial political agreements with the opposition in, in Congress, uh, but they were bound to fail because they basically had different views from, from economic policy and, and, and policy in general with President Lasso. And over the past two years, you know, uh, some additional problems had added, as Natalie mentioned, you know, the uh, people perceive a deterioration of public services in general and, and, the, and, the, and the crime situation in Ecuador. I mean, this is an unprecedented uh, crime uh, situation we are living in Ecuador. And, and I think those factors have had a significant impact on, uh, on the support on the president Lasso presidency. Um, so I think the combination of all those factors is that what has brought us here to a situation where you had a very weak government that was very survived, surviving, that was subject to impeachment before and, and other threats on, on the stability of the government. And that uh, was at the end corner. And, and that's what basically led, I think, to the decision of, of Marte Cruzada. I think we were expecting for, uh, I mean, our most likely scenario was either President Lasso gets impeached or he calls for Marte Cruzada. Uh, we, we thought that the survival of the Lasso administration for the, uh, until 2025 was very difficult because of all, all these reasons. Um, and, and on the Sebastian, I think we. Uh, I think he froze. Uh, Sebastian is with us in in Portugal, so his Wi-Fi is a little bit shaky. But Sebastian, we'll come back to you. Why don't I turn it quickly to Natalie as as we get that fixed? Um, Natalie, you mentioned in in your opening remarks. Uh, a little bit about kind of the early days of the Lasso administration, that he was riding in electoral and political high, um, buoyed in, in part by the success of, of the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then less than halfway into his four-year term now, his approval ratings were at about 13%. He's dealing with this unraveling of the security situation in the country. And as Sebastian just mentioned, he always had this sort of fragile coalition. Um, this is a center right president, as Sebastian mentioned, with a center, center left National Assembly. Can you unpack this a little bit more for us? Um, kind of what sure. you, the erosion of the coalition that he, he initially built? Um, uh, how would you assess how he handled relations with the Pachacutic party in particular? And in retrospect, if he could have maybe done more to maintain the bridges to those coalition parties, uh, or to other parties, and, and, and particularly following the widespread petroleum demonstrations uh, about one year ago. Okay, um, um, to start with, I agree with what Jim Sebastian said, but I will give you an, a very simple example of how the under execution of the government of President Lasso is, you know, this is a government that is, you know, pro enterprise, you know, that believes that the engine of growth is private sector investment. I was, you know, the, the, when I was minister, I led a law, which is the public, a public partnership uh, law, that then it wasn't regulated properly. So it needs a new reglament, which is made by decree. We are two years and we don't have that. And this is the government that wants to attract private investment. So, I mean, this is crazy. I mean, this is something that you do with your team. You know, you do with the experts. You have international experts. You have cooperation from the IDB. And here we are, two years, and we don't have that. We don't have a decree that regulates the day-to-day -day of public-private public partnerships. So that's a clear example of the under-execution, you know, the problems that the government had, the president have to govern, you know, from, you know, we have a constitution that's very presidential. I mean, there are many things you can do through the grids in order to implement, you know, public policy, just like what the one that I that I'm presenting to you, which is public-private investment. As a matter of fact, if you analyze the public-private investment in the last uh, two years, it's an un they are underperforming. Even if you compare it to a leftist uh, government such as President Correa, so that's a point about you know how 
President Lasso is handling his own government, his cabinet. I mean, it is a clear example. And regarding the politics, you know, Sebastian explained and he's back. I mean, he, I think he has a more background to explain the, you know, the political parties, coalitions or that. But, you know, from, from what I can see, um, President Lasso blew his um, coalition with the Social Christian Party led by, um, by uh, Jaime Nebot. You know, two weeks after the two weeks after the the the, the you know the election, the, 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 when he started the when he initiated his government, and you know, it's very very curious. You know, the first the only law that's being passed at the National Assembly, which was a law about creating new taxes, you know, particular to the middle class. You know, that was where uh, President Lasso has a lot of his political capital. It was passed because the Correa party didn't vote, you know? They passed a law with his political enemies that become their allies, you know, in that in that in that particular law. And that created also a lot of uh, suspicion from the citizens when then you couple months later have by ex-vice president uh Glass, you know, coming out of the prisons. So Ecuadorians are not you know, are not dumb people. And that created a lot, a lot of suspicion. And from that, I just saw, you know, a government down the hill and he, President Lasso started criticizing the National Assembly about corruption case. He brought them to the to the fiscal attorney and then he withdrew, withdrew those cases. And then before the, the National Assembly start uh, the impeachment, he again, you know, he again say about this corruption, you know, about he knew many cases. And again, he didn't want, you know, bring them to the to the law. So that creates a lot of suspicion. Um, and he blew, you know, many uh, bridges until Henry Cucalón, which is a very experienced, I respect him very much, the minister of government, but it was too late. I mean, he couldn't do miracles. So, I mean, um, Sebastian is back and I think he has a, more lights on the political side than me. Yeah, and I suspect, Natalia, we'll probably get to uh, questions about Henry Cucalón later on when we talk about uh, kind of potential future candidates in the upcoming election. But um, Sebastian, I want to let you finish your, your opening comments. And then maybe if I can ask you to add on to your response, um, kind of how you would describe the reaction from CONAI and other opposition forces to the decision by President Lasso uh, to invoke Muerte Cruzada. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I told you I was traveling and uh, I think internet is not working that great. I, I ended up talking to myself. I, I don't know how much did you get to to listen from what I was saying, but uh, well, and I, I just finished saying that, the, you know, the political situation for, for President Lasso was very difficult. And I think it got even more difficult due to the the reasons that Natalie mentioned, and, and I, I agree, I think that the, the government didn't do a great job at dealing with politics and, and social issues during the past two years, and that uh, made the situation uh, more complicated. And here we are. I, I don't think, uh, you know, I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, our most likely scenario was uh, neither a Muerte Cruzada or, or an impeachment, but we didn't believe that President Lasso will survive for the, the entirety of his of his term. And um, the question, uh, you have the reaction from the social groups to Muerte Cruzada. Uh, you know, everybody loves to send a National Assembly home, you know, especially in Ecuador. Uh, there, traditionally, there's been little support for, 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 for Congresses in, in, in Ecuador. In this particular Congress was uh, was 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 not uh, a favorite of anyone. So I think you know just shutting down Congress made uh, most people happy, except for those Congress men and women who were bound to lose lose their jobs, who were basically those interested on in fighting uh, the decision. So I think you know most people have welcomed the decision either because you know, you don't, they don't like Congress or because they, they saw it as a way out of the difficult political situation uh, we, were, we were living through. So, you know, at one point, I think, uh, Kona, well, Konaye threatened to, uh, to protest and strike 
if President Lasso called for Muerte Cruzada. However, they toned down the, that uh, speech later on. And I think, you know, they felt, and that was my expectation, that, you know, once you get a Muerte Cruzada, you get a relief from all this conflict. I mean, an initial relief. And once you have a, a specific time frame or timeline for new elections, and, and it's a short timeline because that's what it is stated in the law. And I think under the current political circumstances, you couldn't have extended that timeline for, for much longer. So it's, it's gonna be probably 90 days, 100 days until we have a new Congress and a new president. And I think that made people, political groups and social groups, especially to focus on this, uh, on the opportunity of electing a new government that eventually might be able to govern it and the political opportunities that that, that provided. So I think that is, is that the, the, the concerns from political groups and from CONAIE. However, I think uh, there is still uh, the possibility for unrest if President Lasso tries to uh, tries to move forward with significant reforms during this period. You know, during this period, President Lasso can just can implement legislation uh, on economic matters, and these are legislations that, that have to be signed off by the Constitutional Court. Uh, but still, there are limitations, but I don't think he has right now the legitimacy or the support to move forward this, with significant reforms. And I think, you know, social groups and Konaye might uh, mobilize or might strike if he tries to overdo his, uh, his, his work during this, this period. And... Uh, it, it, and, it, and also because, you know, many of these groups are going to be running for the election and the opportunity to push back against uh, reforms from this not very popular government is a political opportunity in the middle of an election. So I think there's still room for, for, for some mobilization and protest. I don't expect national protest or long protest or... Uh, violent protest during this period, but I think President Lasso might get some pushback on the streets if he tries to push forward with, uh, with, with significant reforms or aggressive reforms. I'll stop there. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, my, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Sebastian, is, is the National Electoral Council announced that the next presidential election will be held in late August of this year. Um, and then I think the winners of that presidential election uh, will hold office until 2025 when the current constitutional period ends and then new elections will be called again. Um, so my question for both of you along those lines is, um, I guess maybe referring a little bit to an interview that President Lasso gave last week in which he indicated he will not run in the upcoming elections. And he described that decision as a move uh, to quote unquote, achieve the common interest of Ecuadorians. Can you maybe walk us through what we might expect from President Lasso's government until the new administration is inaugurated and how you view President Lasso's statement indicating that he will not be a candidate. Um, and maybe one additional question, um, assuming he is not a candidate, what do you think the legacy of this government might be at the end of its term? Three loaded questions. <laughs> who, who goes first? first? Both of you, Natalie, do you wanna go first? Well, um, okay. Um, what do you expect from uh, uh, from President Lasso in the following ninety days? Okay, I don't think um, there is a uh, a lot of a uh, of chance, uh, you know, regarding uh, um, a mobilization. I, I think that risk. I mean, that risk is very low because because again, you have a, a very smart person, you know, running politics now, and there is no room for a labor, you know, law. That, that you know that's a structural reform that they you know the most uh, desired you know by the private sector and Henry Cucalon just say no you know that's not going to pass he knows you know he knows that that will create a lot of unrest so I mean that yeah he made that official yesterday and so the minister of finance 
that they won't push any labor reform. So I think, you know, what you can expect it are mild reforms, you know, covering some mistakes that, you know, what's basically what they did within, with the first decree that was, you know, regarding the tax law was, you know, to, to bring the, the, the middle class to a better position. And um, I think they are ruining, you know, some other laws regarding private investment. They have announced that it will go with a zona franca, like a free trade zone. Uh, for economic uh, development. And also, you know, when they um, implemented the first uh, tax law, they sort of like, um, uh, um, I mean, the incentives for investment are not clear. So I guess they will use this opportunity to make those incentives uh, uh, pretty clear. Uh, but also, you know, they have to be careful because, you know, there is a possibility, that, yeah, the new assembly could be even um, on place before you know, if you have a runoff, you know, there's a lot of, of uncertainty of what's going to happen, you know, because the, the article in the Constitution talks about 90 days, but, you know, if you have a runoff, you, then you wouldn't be able to accomplish the, the general elections in 90 days. So it might be the case, an extreme case, that you will have President Lasso Governi with a new assembly. So, you know, it needs to be careful about what he sends to the court about the case. So I don't perceive any, I don't foresee any any radical change, you know, you know, you know, decrease just to make sure that the um, rules for private investment are clear. That's what I will expect from these uh, ninety days. Thanks so much, Natalie. Uh, yeah, same question. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I will. Uh, you know, uh, it was surprising that President Lasso announced. Well, first, he said yeah. that he won't be running. Uh, I think. You know, if he didn't plan to run for the election, uh, Muerte Cruzada made less sense for me. I think uh, Muerte Cruzada was the most disruptive uh, way forward. I think uh, I, I honestly will have preferred for President Lasso to step down and for Vice President Borrell to take over. And we will have like a transition, a very lame duck transition government for two years instead of having two years of elections because we're gonna have elections this year and next year, everybody's gonna be focused on a new election. And the government that is gonna get elected this year, I think it's gonna be a very populist government next year because they will be thinking about getting or trying to get reelected in 2025. So I think this was the most disruptive alternative uh, that uh, that we had and uh, at the end President Lasso decided to go this way. I will have, if, the, if he didn't want to run, I will have uh, go a different direction. But uh, in terms of his, uh, he, well, I already discussed what he could do during this period. I don't expect much. Um, in terms of the, his legacy, that's what you referred to, you know, I think, I mean, I think the pre President Lasso has been a, 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 a president that, that, has, uh, that has worked by democratic rules, uh, which I think it is important. Uh, I think as a president that has made a significant effort to uh, bring Ecuador to the world or try to, at least. I mean, just opening up or trying to open up Ecuador. Uh, mostly in, the, in, in, in terms of just reaching out to the United States to, I mean, to traditional allies, but to new international allies to try to move forward with uh, trade agreements. I think uh, that, that's very important. However, I think, unfortunately, uh, an economic liberalization agenda, which I think it is very important and very needed in Ecuador, it's gonna be tied to the Lasso government or to this not so popular or somehow discredited Lasso administration. And I think that's gonna uh, put some weight uh, on any significant economic liberalization reforms going forward, uh, at least in the eye of the public. And I think the opposition will heavily use that to discredit economic liberalization policies going forward. And I think that's an unfortunate legacy because you know, we, many people 
me included, were included, were uh, expecting for President Lasso to, I mean, he's the first center right president and pro business president and pro investment president that Ecuador has elected in over 20 years, for sure. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we were re really expecting for, uh, for, for this to be a government that could uh, work really hard into liberalizing the Ecuadorian economy, which is, I, I think is something that it is, it is needed. And he hasn't been able to do it. And I think the fact that he, he somehow failed in doing that uh, will wait on, on, on such initiatives in the future. Uh, so that's an unfortunate legacy, I would say. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Maybe while we're here, and, and I'll encourage the audience again, if they have questions, to use the, the Q&A function at the bottom of their screens. Uh, we have a question somewhat relatedly from, from our friend June, um, who writes, hi, and thanks for these excellent analyses. Why, after the Muerte Cruzada and the Constitutional Court's rejection of the challenges, are the PK slash CONAI and also the Correista uh, responses, uh, uh, what, oh, sorry, wait. Uh, the rejection, of the, yeah. Why, why have they accepted um, the, the Muerte Cruzada uh, in the lead up to the upcoming elections? Are they not going to demonstrate because both opposition groups think the elections in August will advantage them in the assembly and perhaps winning the presidency? To, to either of you. Okay, well, um, both uh, uh, Pres President Correa and I believe the ISA, uh, say in the beginning that that was undemocratic um, measure that the country was not an un, you know an um, upheaval and you know in order to um, President Lasso to use that constitutional clause, but they were eager you know after that you know to be and be ready you know for elections and and I mean it, it it's it's interesting to analyze you know the recent uh, sectional elections for. Uh, mayors and for what we call here, you know, governors, but it's called prefectos. They're elected, you know, by popular vote. And despite that, um, the um, UNES winning the, you know, the most important cities in the country, which are Quito and Guayaquil. Guayaquil, you know, was run by a very, very terrible um, um, management of the city by Cynthia Viteri. So it was, you know, like the, 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 it was open, you know, in the sense that citizens were very, very unhappy with that administration. So people read, you know, with that, that the acceptance of Korea is it's very, very high. But I will argue that's not, you know, and that is no more than, you know, a core, core 20%. And so, I mean, there is plenty of space for others to have a significant participation in this election. Saying that, the problem is the fragmentation of the center right, you know, and that's something that we have been experienced for the last um, 20 years. And it's a shame, you know, even for the electoral, you know, even for voting for mayors and for prefectos, well, it was the same, the same tonic, you know, it on an ability to get a, a common candidate. And you will have a fragmentation on the left, but that will be less, you know, than right. And of course, that created an opportunity for uh, UNES and, and, and Pachacutic. And I have to say, you know, that what Pachacutic is doing and um, it's not easy to figure out. I mean, uh, both of them haven't announced their candidates or coalitions in order to, you know, to look to, to the general elections. So saying that uh, UNES and, and Pachacut, of course, they are the forces that have the most mayors and prefectos in the country, but, and maybe they have an, an initial advantage, but you know it all depends on what happened with the with the final candidates in in the country. Yeah, I mean, I, I see two clear opportunities, political opportunities in this election. One is I see I think for the Coristas, I think they have a clear shot at uh, at for sure getting the largest block in Congress. Because you know, Congress is elected in the first round election, and I they already got their largest block in this Congress, I, and I think they have the opportunity to elect an even bigger block in a, in a new Congress for sure. But also, they might have a shot to the presidency, and that's basically because you know they are the clear opposition to this discredited 
uh, lasso government. And that they have remained as the clear alternative, political alternative to the Lasso government. And at least that's what they presented themselves like. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity for that. Uh, you know, people who are frustrated with the situation right now uh, might go uh, for them. And they can also somehow show or, or say that things were better when they were in government. And there's uh, some people might agree with that. And I think so, that's why I think they have a clear opportunity for Congress and for, and for the presidency. But I also think that there's a clear political opportunity for uh, an outsider candidate who goes beyond this Correismo and anti-Correismo political dynamic that we've been living through for the past 15 years. And I think there's, a, there's, there's an interesting space there you know, uh, someone who, who can just propose something different that is not focused on this conflict between preventing the Correistas from, from coming back or supporting the, the Correistas. You know, I think people are fed up with that, uh, with that conflict. And, uh, and especially, and, and that could be someone on the left or on the right. You know, someone on the left already made the mark in the last election, that's Jaco Perez. He was a clear outsider candidate of that election and he almost made it to the second round. And I think he could still have an opportunity in this election. He has remained somehow outside of, the, of this political dynamic. Uh, but there, I, I can also see an opportunity for someone on the right, especially on uh, an anti-crime platform, for example. And we've seen, you know, just these days, how a specific candidate with that profile has surfaced I mean, he's the. Uh, I mean, I've been following what he's been saying for the past couple of months, and I was expecting something like this uh, to to happen. You know, I thought he was he could be the Bukele Ecuatoriano, as some as, as some people say. And I think there's a clear opportunity there. You know, I, I, for an outsider in this election, either from the left or on the right, who who go beyond that this this traditional. I mean, from what we've been seeing for the past 15 years. Uh, so, so how I see, and, and you know, the Correistas in Pachacute and Conaye, I would say, are the political forces more uh, better order, organized than any other political forces. Uh, they can mobilize support pretty quick. So I think they have an advantage uh, in vis-a-vis uh, -vis other political forces right now. And so uh, that's, that's why I, I think, you know, Pachacute and Correistas see this as an opportunity, as a political opportunity, something that doesn't happen necessarily with Partido Social Cristiano or other political forces. I, I would like to add to the, yeah. to the comment of Sebastian. I mean, I think um, I agree with, with what you have said, and but I think you have to read also the you know the sentiment of the Ecuadorians. And of course, President Correa will try to have citizens to look back, you know, with this. With, with me, you were better, you know, you have better access to education, to health. But also, I agree with Sebastian, there is a, a plenty of room for somebody that want Ecuadorians to look forward to something different, you know. Ecuadorians are so fed up with people fighting, with these discussions, with these, uh, you know, destruction uh, narrative. And I think there is a plenty of space for that outsider. And yes, we have John Toppy, which is an, uh, you know, has been, uh, is a fighter, is a war fighter, and he has been very, very straightforward, you know. And that, you know, is reading, he's reading very well the fear that Ecuadorians are facing right now. And that could be a surprise. But also, I would like to talk about another candidate, which is Otto, the vice president of uh, Lenin Moreno. And I think he's, he has a more a convey, you know, a more unified um, a speech. Um, maybe he will be, um, you know, um, you know, have this correlation to relation with with Lenin Moreno. But I think he also have a have a chance. He has a more moderate, you know, leader regarding the security issues, but it also has a more broad view about the the Ecuadorian uh, problems and and solutions. So I, I will have to say also you know, how he will pick for vice president and how many, you know, and, and I agree. I mean, the most organized political parties are UNES and, and Pachacuten and, and Conaye. 
and you don't have that mobilization, you know, for the right. And it will, it will, it will, um, it, that you know, a right uh, approach of of economic development will work. And and most, I would say, most Ecuadorians are centrists or don't have a core ideology. ideology. You know, they want just the problems to get fixed. And as I say, you know, whoever creates that vision to move forward to fix, you know, not only problems like security, but education and health, I think we'll have a nice space. Natalie, just following up on that very quickly, uh, we've seen President Lasso take an increasingly hard line on security, and there's been talk about his administration now investing even more in the coming weeks in child malnutrition, which also comes on the heels of this historic blue bonds agreement um, that we saw a few weeks ago. Do you think there's anything that President Lasso can do in the coming weeks that might significantly alter the electoral prospects of various movements? I, I don't think so. And I will give you, you know, examples. You know, the radar, you know, one of the very important radars, you know, to control the drug trafficking in the coast, it's uh, in, in Monte Cristo, which is, you know, very close to the ports where the drugs are trying to get, you know, out of the country. He haven't been able to fix it to bring a new one. I mean, with the great relationship that we have with the United States, why don't, you know, bring one in, a, in, a, in a, an airplane and have it, you know, done? So, you know, politics is about symbols. You know, people need to feel, you know, that not only that you are doing it, but you have to create those symbols that people will relate. You know, we have this hideous crime in Montañita. What do you expect? To have the army, that now we can have the army on the street, you'd have the army right there. So people need to feel, you know, not only that he's doing, he needs to, you know, make people understand that he's doing something. So common things like this, this radar, which is crucial for surveillance, it hasn't been replaced. So there's no explanation for, for that, for, you know, for the lack of action. So I don't expect anything from this government to tell you the truth. It has been very difficult. You know, it's a complex situation, but you have to handle, you know, with effectiveness, you know, and also with symbols that create that images that people need to see to understand that somebody is in control and somebody is fighting for it and somebody knows what to do about it. Um, we have two questions from the audience. Maybe I'll direct the first to you, Sebastian. Um, this one says, why, if Pat Pachacutic thinks it will win, did it try to file an inconstitutional motion on the Muerte Cruzada? Don't didn't uh, don't Pachacutic legislatures fear that they will perform poorly without Yaku? I mean, they, uh, you know, they will never. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned before, uh, what Pachacutic got in this Congress was unprecedented. I mean, the representation of Pachacutic in the outgoing Congress was unprecedented and was basically due to the fact that they had uh, Yacu Perez as a candidate. You know, traditionally uh, indigenous candidates haven't performed that well because they have usually had uh, a very ethnic, I would say political agenda. And that was not the case with uh, Yacu Perez. I mean, because he had this uh, political agenda that had to do with protection of water and the environment and things like that. Uh, he had a, like a more, uh, like a less, uh, I would say, ethnic political agenda. And I think that appealed to a broader group of Ecuadorians, which uh, hasn't happened with the previous indigenous candidates. And that's what almost got uh, Jaco Perez to the second round in the election. And that's how he performed so well in the first round and got all these uh, legislators elected. Uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they will be able to repeat something like that unless they get a candidate like Yaku Perez, which I, let, let, let's see, let's see, you know, who, who finally they come up with. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's what, I think that concerned them and I think you know, the assembly members from Pachacutic in Congress, they were definitely interested on remaining at his jobs. 
for sure, because I think many of them won't be able to get reelected. So I understand that move from the perspective of the Pachacutic uh, assembly members in Congress. However, from the perspective of the wider, I think, the Pachacutic movement and Conaye, the combination of the two of them, I think the fact that they have remained actively, actively opposed to the Lasso government, again, is a political opportunity for them. I think they've already profited from that, like the Correista did in the local elections back in February. I mean, that the, the, the position that they had against this unpopular uh, government uh, of President Lasso has already helped them politically. And I think the great, uh, the, 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 those who profited, profited the most in the local elections were Correistas and Pachacuti. And I think they both feel that they have the momentum to just, uh, a, get a, a a good result uh, in the in in the new election. So I I don't think they will do great, but I think they might do better than other political organizations that I think are gonna be uh, they're gonna be caught with their pants down uh, in this uh, heading into this uh, this new election with such a a short time and and and, and no capacity to really prepare for 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 an election. So that's, uh, I think that's the, that's their play. Guy, there's something that I would like to add, and that's that you need to understand now the electorate in Ecuador, and it's a pretty young electorate. I mean, there's just somebody, you know, this outsider candidate, you know, that appealed to the young people. And remember the young, the many, many, you know, citizens that are among 18 and 22, uh, don't remember the Korea presidency. And we saw that in the last election, we saw the, the a candidate, a new candidate, a businessman called Airbus, um, that surfaced very, very fast, you know, among the young vote. And 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 that vote is it's um it has a different um ambitions, different uh even Yaku appealed to that, you know, at, at that, to that segment of the population. So candidates need to be aware about that. I mean, that's a very important, a very important piece of the electorate in, in, in this election. Even if I recall correctly, President Lasso did as well. He was on TikTok a lot in the, the final weeks of, uh, of the campaign. So, so I, think, I think that's a big piece of it. Um, we have uh, a comment from Jonas who writes, uh, given the deteriorating security situation, can the police and military proactively respond to cartel violence during the Muerte okay. Cruzada? Can security forces act independently and should they? Well, I mean, there is something that President Lasso tried to um, pass in the Congress, and the Congress didn't provide any solution, which is, you know, we have a constitution that um, that uh, directs the efforts of the army to protect Ecuador for international, you know, conflict. So it's it's kind of very difficult to have the army involved. I mean, we you to understand to explain, we have fifty thousand people in the army and. I will say I'm about the same number at the pol at the national police, which can you know is the one that is indicated to to fight the, the you know the the, the trafficking issues. Um, Last of record to um, you know to um, a loophole in the law, you know, calling these um, uh, narco traffic organizations terrorists, so the army can you know enter in the fight against against them. Um, so I think there's room, yeah, there's room, there's room for that, but the problem is the inaction, you know, and, and, and then this is, this is a huge problem that you need to tackle with different, you know, um, tools, you know, you need to have intelligence, you need to have, um, a, or, um, a bureaucratic entities, you know, fighting in the same direction, and then you need to have a judicial, which is really independent. And there, you know, things that we have been from the civil society proposing to President Lasso, like, you know, using this judge without faces that, you know, were you know, used in, 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 in Colombia uh, as something that they should, you know, put to the National Assembly for, for approval. Because also there's a problem if you get these people, but then, you know, uh, with game, with tricks, they get out, you know, in a week from, from the prison. So you need to have an integral approach. And I will say that, that United States has a lot, a lot to do 
in that relationship, you know, against uh, drugs. I mean, this is a global problem. You know, if you have consumption, you will have a uh, offer, you will have supply. So also, you know, President Lasso has been very shy in bringing this problem, you know, as a leader, um, as a Latin American leader and be a driving of the US-Ecuador relationship. And remember, the United States uh, have an $8 billion plan, Plan Colombia. You can say that it didn't work, but then you can learn from those mistakes. And then you have, you know, very, very uh, mild um, proposals from your Congress um, to have include Ecuador in the Central American Economic Act. I mean, but you are not talking in that relationship about, I mean, there being little things, you know, like United States providing some some um, some tools, you know, to fight, but it isn't a, a, a dialogue that produce a bilateral, you know, a, a, a strategy to fight crime. And this is a global issue. I mean, you cannot fix it as just a president of Ecuador. I mean, you need to bring leadership uh, for Latin America and, you know, with the United States and with your allies in Europe too. And that is not happening either. So, Sian, I want to give you the, the opportunity to comment on that if you'd like. Yeah, um, I think that unfortunately, uh, I think secre Ecuadorian security forces are ill prepared to deal with this kind of violence and, and this kind of organized crime. Um, that's basically because, you know, Ecuador has no experience on this. The crime situation we'll, we're living through now, it's unprecedented. And the most violent part of the crime wave we're, we, we've seen is basically connected to international criminal organizations that work with local criminal organizations. And I think our security forces lack the, uh, the resources, the training, uh, the experience, uh, I think they can be easily penetrated uh, by the, the, the same crime organizations. Uh, so I don't see a, a, a clear uh, approximate solution to this uh, situation, unless we get, uh, Ecuadorian forces get significant international help, either from our neighbors or the Americans, uh, I think uh, we're going to be struggling on dealing with this, uh, with this uh, situation. And that's, uh, I think that's basically what we've been seeing, you know. I mean, the government has tried everything, has tried just work on specific areas, has tried to move, to, to pull the military to help, and, and the situation has not really improved uh, so we we definitely have to go a different way uh, i'm not really sure how uh, but it's gonna take a while for for the Ecuadorian state to take control of the situation that's my perception yeah i, I will note uh, just in terms of u.s engagement on on uh, the situation in ecuador there was the passage of this historic uh, bipartisan bill called the u.s ecuador partnership act um, which dedicates uh, a, a ton of resources uh, into Ecuador across various fronts. Um, but I think the fruits of, of that good labor um, have yet to be seen uh, in part because of the process. But I think they are forthcoming and, and maybe Lasso won't necessarily benefit from them uh, during his time as president. I have a question about that because I read the bill and I don't see any provision of money in that bill. I mean, there is it's a very beautiful, you know, piece of legislation about you know how you can help want to help Ecuador uh in this particular time of democracy but you know for me it's not clear it's not clear the tools it's not clear the budget you know it's is you know it's uh it, without money it's just words yeah so the bill instructs various U.S. agencies to present before the Congress a plan which would then flesh out uh the resource allocations across all of the categories within the bill uh, but that, that, that's what I meant when I said at present, he hasn't yet seen the fruits of, of that good work. Um, yeah. And from outside, you know, it, and knowing how institutions work in Washington, it seemed to me that was sort of like uh, a solo, you know, as a solo uh, intention from the Congress that wasn't coordinated with the, with the, with the uh, government institutions, because it would be that way 
the law will be more specific and perhaps you know time will be gained if you had a more articulated effort in, in when you um you know when you when you uh, present that 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 law at the congress yeah, I mean, I think it's in part also a product of, of the current state of the U.S. Congress um, in, in terms of the ability to get bipartisan things passed. Um, and so uh, it was incorporated into the NDAA, which is one of the few big pieces of legislation that always gets passed every year um, and signed by the president. So there was executive input and ultimately executive signature on it. Um, but as I mentioned, the, we won't see kind of the specific number of figures uh, until likely after Lasso's presidency. Um, I want to make sure I address the, the last question here, because I know we're going a little bit over time. Um, and this is a, a, also a forward-looking question, which says, uh, if Correismo wins, uh, what sort of government would you expect? Uh, would it be a more moderate version of the one we saw, uh, or, or perhaps a more extreme one? Big question. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, Sebastian. Uh, okay, well, I have more, my own reading on on that. Let's see what happens, but uh, I will expect for a new Koreaista government if we get one uh, to be as, as radical as ever on the political side. I think, uh, you know, Koreismo will like to build back the Koreaista political order that uh, we got during Koreismo that was implemented through the Correista constitution and through the uh, political organization that they managed to build here. I mean, to build in, in, in Ecuador in terms of, of institutional control. So I, I, I would expect for a new Correista administration to try to build back the Correista political order. However, I will also expect for a new Correista administration to be more aligned to the second part of the Correista period in terms of which I think it was a more pragmatic, I would say, uh, period of Correismo. You know, I think Correismo was very radical at the beginning. You know, you remember they stopped paying foreign debt. They uh, confiscated property, they changed contracts, they did a, a, a lot of things, but I think they became more pragmatic towards the second part of, of, of the Correista administration. Uh, they signed reluctantly, but they did sign uh, a free trade agreement with the European Union. Uh, they came back to international markets issuing international debt, and they made a big push uh, for large scale mining in Ecuador. And what we have on large scale mining in Ecuador basically was developed under Correisma. So I think I will expect for a new Correista government. And also the circumstances are different, you know, uh, the, the economic situation, the, the, the world economic situation is different. The Latin American situation is different. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, we, we don't have right now the, uh, the major boom in uh, in in, uh, in basic uh, you know export products that we had during the first part of Correismo, so it is a different situation. So I will expect for Correismo to be as as I say, you know, as radical as ever on the political side, but uh, hopefully more pragmatic on the economic side. Well, I agree with Sebastian, you know, I was in the administration when I have to fight very, very hard for the for the deal with the European Union. So um, I think it's, it will be a very pragmatic government. They need to show results. But uh, you have to also understand that the Correismo has an advantage. They know how to talk to the poorest people of Ecuador. They know how to communicate with that um, underserved population in, in the country. So they have they have that clear advantage regard um, how to communicate, how to understand, you know, how they feel about the current situation. So I think it will be hard on the security issues. I mean, they will have a, they will have a strong uh, position on, on that. And, but regarding the rest, I would think they will have a center leftist um, approach. And, you know, they will be concerned with results, trying to get the most um, I agree with Sebastian. Uh, they need uh, 
they need to get into the political institutions because Korea wants to go back. I mean, that's pretty clear for me. Uh, but also they want to have an interim administration that needs to show results and to combat, you know, the lasso model. So I'm, I think that, you know, the pretty um, right far, you know, ideology, it, you know, it will, it never has been work and it won't work. And they will have that horse, you know, running against uh, that and more to, you know, what the Correismo is known for you know, appealing to the needs of the citizens. And, and they have a, you know, it's, a, it's controversial, controversial, but I think a, in the social side of the uh, Korea administration, they, they show a lot of results. And also you need to know that Korea has, you know, people that has been uh, very loyal and that have a uh, experience in how to, um, in public management, and, and you need to have to take that in consideration. They have a good structure on the ground and they have a good structure to govern. And, 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 and that could be in a, in a side, um, an interim administration that can move uh, the, the wheels of government. We'll be monitoring it closely. Um, I want to thank Natalie and Sebastian. We've gone a bit over, I think we're, we're about now 10 minutes over the time we asked of both of you. So I want to thank you. Um, but I do think that's indicative of, of the great interest here. It was a really robust question and answer session. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for attending this Global Americans event um, and, and really thank Natalie and Sebastian for an enriching conversation. Um, and, uh, and we look to, to host many more of these, particularly as the situation evolves. We again wanna thank you both for being with us today. Uh, and again, thank everyone who, who joined us here for this conversation. We look forward to doing another one soon. Thank you again.